Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Haas. I'm the director of the West Virginia Office of Research and Strategic Planning, which houses the state statistical analysis center. I'm also deputy director for the West Virginia Division of Justice and Community Services. It is my pleasure today to welcome you to this webinar, Improving Capacity for Crime Reporting, Data Quality and Imputation Methods Using State Incident-Based Reporting System Data. It is part of a series of webinars hosted by the Justice Research and Statistics Association to promote the sharing of information by and among the state statistical analysis centers and other justice-related agencies. Before we go any further, I want to thank our partners at the Bureau of Justice Statistics for making this series of webinars possible. I also need to cover a few logistical items. First, we will be recording today's session for future playback. The link to the recording will be posted on the JRSA website and emailed to attendees. Second, today's webinar is being audio cast via the speakers on your computer. To access the audio broadcast, select audio broadcast under the communication drop-down menu. I think we can do it, I think it's just the internet. If you do not have speakers or would prefer to use your phone, please use the number contained in your registration email or on the event tab located on the top left side of the screen. There are many people joining us today, so we have automatically muted the lines of all participants to reduce background noise. If you're not a presenter, please keep your phone muted. If you typed in star six to unmute, unmute your uh, phone, please retype it in in order to remute it. If you have questions for the presenters, we encourage you to submit them using the chat feature on the right side of, the, of your screen. Please select host and presenter from the drop down menu next to the text box. If you would like to communicate with JRSA staff during the webinar, please submit your comments using the chat feature to Jason Trask or host. This session is scheduled for one hour and 30 minutes and will end promptly at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. If you have technical difficulties or get disconnected during the session, you can reconnect the session using the same link that you used to join the session initially. You can also call WebEx technical support at 1-866-229 three, two, three, nine. During today's webinar, we will be utilizing uh, the polling feature to gather feedback and to help guide the discussion. These polls will appear as pop-up windows on the lower right hand of your screen. Your feedback is important to us. Please take, time, take the time to respond to these polls, and it will also help with the interaction and discussion of the webinar. So, in order to start, I'd like to go ahead and briefly introduce the presenters today. Uh, my name is Stephen Haas, and our main presenter today is Christina LaValle. As noted before, I am the director of the West Virginia Office of Research and Strategic Planning and the Deputy Director of the West Virginia Division of Justice and Community Services. The Office of Research and Strategic Planning houses the Criminal Justice Statistical Analysis Center, and it also houses another unit called the Justice Center for Evidence-Based Practice. Both of these units in the ORSP work together to provide research, evaluation, and statistical information to support the division's mission related to criminal justice planning, policy development, and the infusion of evidence-based practices in the state's justice administration. The ORSP's work ranges from research on the accuracy of crime statistics, which is the topic of this webinar, to topics such as offender reentry, sexual assault and domestic violence victimizations, 
offender classification, the effectiveness of community-based treatments and supervision programs, as well as juvenile delinquency. Christina Lavalle, the lead on this present project that's being discussed today, is a research specialist for the West Virginia Statistical Analysis Center. She has been an analyst since 2002, or I'm sorry, 2012. She holds a BS in mathematics from the University of Minnesota Duluth and a Master's of Science degree in Applied and Computational Mathematics from John Hopkins University. Her work with the SAC involves conducting research in statistical analyses, primarily in the areas of statistical accuracy and NIBRS imputation methods, as well as hotspot research related to a recently BJA-funded drug market intervention project in Charleston, West Virginia. Her earlier work related to this project um, received uh, the 2013 Douglas Yearwood National Publication Award, which was presented by the Justice Research and Statistics Association. Now, to the topic at hand, that is the present project on improving state capacity for crime reporting through the use of data quality and imputation methods. I'd like to provide some information for how and why this project came about in West Virginia. As the director of the State Statistical Analysis Center, I've recognized for several years that simply reporting data as is or as submitted to the state repository was not likely as accurate as it could be, particularly for assessing the state's crime trends. Moreover, we are a state that does not have data from routine victimization surveys or large-scale self-report surveys of delinquent or criminal behavior, um, which is also characteristic of many other states. However, we do have a robust system of NIBRS reporting. So as a state, we are very reliant, we are very reliant on incident-based reporting data for estimating crime trends for the state and evaluating various crime reduction efforts, such as the uh, drug market intervention uh, program that we're going, that we're evaluating now. Hence, the need for improving the accuracy of this data source. Um, and we have several projects over the years that have had to use NIGRS data for evaluation purposes. Because of the state's strong participation in the NIBRS program, West Virginia is a state well-suited to study such issues as data quality and imputation. We were one of the first states to become certified as a NIBRS reporting state and are considered to have 100% geographic coverage. Moreover, we have an established history of NIBRS data reporting since 1999, with improvements made each year after that. These characteristics allow us to set up the simulations necessary to explore and test the various data quality and imputation techniques that we're presenting here today. And as a result, I felt as the director that we could make a contribution not only for the state of West Virginia and its needs, but also use our data uh, to assist other states who are seeking to make greater use of their NIBRS data for tracking crime trends and conducting evaluation research. So, with the support of uh, JRSA and the Bureau of Justice Statistics pass-through funds, we have completed two research projects designed to identify what we call easy to use but accurate methods for imputation. The primary goal of this work is to develop imputation methods that are accessible to state repository staff and others interested in proving the accuracy of their crime trends. As you might guess, there are many different imputation methods out there, including those used by the FBI. But through our work, we have discovered that few states or localities use any sort of imputation and instead simply report what is given to them by law enforcement agencies in their jurisdiction. However, our work tells us that this leads to less than accurate crime reporting. So we have the first poll. 
Um, in this case, we have two polling questions for you to consider and respond to. This is something we will be doing throughout the webinar to keep you involved and facilitate the discussions. You will have 30 seconds to respond before the results are posted. First, we want to know, is NIBRS uh, data available to you in your jurisdiction, and do you have concerns with the accuracy of reporting and the data in your area? Thank you for participating in this poll. And as you're participating in this poll, I will uh, move along. So we feel that one of the reasons why many jurisdictions do not make use of imputation methods um, could be due to the complexity of the work that's involved. That is why we've chosen to try to develop imputation methods and provide the techniques, uh, making it easier to use and easier to apply in the states. So as you'll see uh, in the following presentation, we are seeking to provide a step-by-step -step guide with, read with uh, readily available software such as Excel and macros to place the capacity to, to impute NIBRS data into the hands of people most often working with it. As noted above, we had two research projects and reports that were completed based on the work. Um, the research reports for both projects are located on the West Virginia SAC and JRSA websites. The first project used one year of state IVR data to develop data quality and several imputation methods for partial and non-reporting agencies. The second project then tested and validated those techniques and imputation methods on longitudinal data in the state of West Virginia. As many of you know, the FBI has used imputation methods nationally for many years. But in recent years, a number of researchers have suggested that these methods are becoming outdated given modern technology. And have also recommended the use of more advanced computational techniques, including longitudinal methods to impute for missing values, as well as methods accounting for seasonality and other data issues. For our second poll, we want to know whether you or your agency uses methods currently to assess data quality issues, and whether you have processes for auditing and or improving your NIBRS data in your area. We appreciate your participation in this poll. And I'm sure that these polls and the results will be very interesting. So the methods developed by the West Virginia SAC incorporate many of the recommendations made by other researchers as noted above. We believe our methods to be advanced enough to be accurate, but also accessible to others interested in improving their state and local statistics with some guidance. Moreover, our approach ta does take into account the changes that occur due to seasonality as well as the variation in reporting patterns across agencies. So, without further delay, I'd like to hand over the presentation to Christina LaValle to present and discuss the imputation methods developed by the West Virginia SAC. She will begin by providing an overview of the steps necessary to apply imputation methods on NIBRS data in your state. Thank you, Stephen. So the process of applying imputation methods involves the following steps. First, we obtain the data. Next, we're going to use that data to identify and classify zero reports as either missing data or true, value, true zeros. Next, we'll identify and classify irregular reporting and outliers. The fourth step is identifying any non-reporting agencies. Next, we obtain population estimates for agencies. We also obtain the Metropolitan Statistical Area or the MSA status for agencies. We then apply our imputation methods. And finally, we conclude this process with calculating any statistics that we wish to produce. So we're going to proceed with an overview of what the methods are, how they work, and view a few examples. Step one is to obtain the crime data. In West Virginia, we get our state's NIBRS data from the state repository once a year. 
to set up the data for this imputation process, we need to create three data sets that include aggregate violent crimes, property crimes, and non-index crimes by month. These imputation methods are applied to the aggregate crimes. The data sets are going to include column headers for the originating agency identifier, which is the ORI, the agency's name, and each month, January through December, which totals 14 variables. The data for each agency reporting will be listed in the rows of the data set. We're going to view an example of the data layout later in the presentation. Our second step is to identify missing data. Here, um, in the NIBRS data that we receive from the state repository, there's no variable or value to indicate that data is missing. This means that in the data that we get, the crime count of zero can signify that no crimes there have occurred, that is, a zero reported is a true zero, or that data that is not reported is actually missing. Determining whether a zero indicates missing data in the incidence-based reporting data can be challenging when only one year of data is available. This process can also be very time-consuming. The West Virginia SAC has developed guidelines to help identify zero reports that are suggestive of missing data. In developing these guidelines, it involved closely inspecting three years of data to determine whether zeros reported were likely true zeros or missing data, recording the agency reporting patterns, creating helper variables based on these reporting patterns, and determining threshold variables for the helper variables. We suspect that these guidelines that we developed will perform well in other states, but future research is needed to test and verify that. If you are interested in developing your own guidelines for your state, a similar process can be replicated, and the details of the process we used are in our 2013 imputation report. Let's move on to the zero classification guidelines that were developed using the West Virginia incident-based reporting data. So the zero classification guidelines involve four steps based on agency reporting. Three helper variables are used in these guidelines. The first variable we, we call NCZ, and it's the number of consecutive months where all crimes are zero in all of the aggregate crime categories. The second helper variable is the total number of property crimes, and we call this total P. The third helper variable is POP status, which stands for the population status. It's a dichotomous variable that's either population, meaning that the agency covers an associated population, or zero population, meaning that the agency is not associated with a population. Zero population agencies overlap the coverage of primary police jurisdictions that already report data. Using these variables, we developed the following guidelines to identify potential missing data. The first guideline is that for any month, if a zero is reported, but there are non-zeros reported in the crime counts in either violent property or non-index crimes, then that zero for that month is a true zero. The second guideline states that if the total P is greater than 25, and the NCZ, or number of consecutive zeros, is greater than zero, those zeros are identified and potentially missing. Guideline three states that if the number of consecutive zeros is greater than or equal to four, the zeros are identified as missing. The final guideline of this uh, algorithm is that if agencies are classified or categorized as zero population agencies, then the two guidelines in regards to the total population and the number of consecutive zeros, guideline two and three, may not hold true as indicators of missing data. This is because some of the zero reporting agencies have, are specialized units and their reporting patterns may reflect that. So we want to emphasize that the purpose of these guidelines is to identify agencies that are suspected to have issues with missing data. Once the agencies are identified, the data needs to be manually inspected to determine and classify whether the data is missing or not. Manual inspection involves looking at the data that is reported and referencing the zero classification guidelines. While these guidelines help automate the process of identifying the data with potential issues, 
there is still a small degree of subjectivity involved in making decisions and classifying whether data is acceptable or not. Therefore, we do have to stress the importance of being conservative when making decisions. So to assist with assessing data quality, the West Virginia SAC has developed a tool using a macro-embedded Excel workbook to identify missing data and irregular data. The tool and the um, VBA or Visual Basic syntax are located on the JRSA Incident-Based Reporting Resource Center website. Shown here is the data format needed to use the tool. The column headers include the ORI, agency name, and then the monthly data for January through December, indicated by month one through month 12, or M1 through M12. At the bottom of this, of this workbook, you'll notice that there are three worksheets set up and they're titled V, P, and Z. This is where you will enter your violence, your aggregate violence data, property data, and non-index data. These worksheets will be combined later on. So, you simply can copy and paste data that you have aggregated from a pivot table or from another data source, or you can manually enter the data into the appropriate worksheet. Once your data is entered on all three sheets, you can click the button on the right that says click here to classify zeros, and this will run the macro without having to go into the developer tab in Microsoft Excel. And the majority, actually all of the macros are launched by clicking on buttons in this macro. So when you run the macro, all the data is merged and a text box appears to display the guidelines to the users. This is just an overview of the guidelines that we went through on the previous slide. To view data, click OK on the text box. As we can see, the data from the violence property and non-index crimes are now merged into this new worksheet. The data are sorted by agency name and organized by the violent property and non-index crimes. All blanks that were located in the data entry page have now been changed to zeros. This new display of data is the setup needed to create the helper variables for the zero classification guidelines. In running this macro, you'll notice that five new variables have been created. They include the crime type, agency type, total P, NCZ, and POP status. Those are located at the top of the sheets in the variable field for each column. The crime type is an ancillary variable that we use to help sort the data by violent property and non-index for each agency. The, crime the agency type is a descriptive variable to categorize the agency. Total P helps us identify the reporting volume for the agency. NCZ helps determine the run length of the zeros reported by the agency. And the POP status is, again, a dichotomous variable that helps determine the population status of the agency, which we use in our guidelines. What the macro also does is it highlights agencies and data that have potential missing data. The sample data here was selected to illustrate the functioning of the tool, so we will see many examples of data quality issues. The frequency and issues in the sample data is not reflective of what is actually reported in the West Virginia incident-based reporting data. So as you can see, agencies are highlighted in either pink or orange. The agencies highlighted in pink indicate that the total P is greater than 25. Agencies highlighted in orange have an, have an NCZ that's greater than or equal to four. If an agency is identified by both of our criteria used in the guidelines, it will appear pink. All of the zeros that are suspected as missing data are highlighted in gray. At this point, it is the analyst task to manually inspect the data by looking at the data that was reported and referencing the zero classification guidelines. Again, we wanna emphasize that this tool is used to efficiently identify data and it is important to be conservative when making decisions about classifying the data. So let's look at a few examples based on this worksheet. I, I hope that it is large enough for everybody to see, and I do believe that there is a zoom in feature on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. So the first agency that's highlighted in pink, um, it's a municipal police department. 
um, it's highlighted in pink, so it means that the total, the agency total P was greater than 25. In the variable NCZ, we can notice that the number of consecutive zeros was two, and those zeros are highlighted in months 11 and 12. This agency, since it's a police department, is classified as population. If we look at the data that was reported in months one through 10, it appears that the crimes that were reported were done so with relative consistency. Therefore, in our opinion, it seems reasonable that we can apply guideline two of the zero classification guidelines and classify the data in months 11 and 12 as missing data. If we move along down our sheet, let's look at the, the first agency highlighted in orange. This is Jefferson DNR. Here, it was identified because the NCZ was greater than or equal to four. Much of the data is highlighted in gray, and the largest NCZ is six. This DNR agency is classified as a, not, as a zero population agency. So we look at the reported data, and we will consider guideline four. Since DNR is a special type of agency and sparse reporting may be typical, the zeros reported will be classified as true zeros. More details about classifying zero population agencies are in both of our imputation reports. Again, we want to be conservative when classifying data, and in this case, it appears that there is quite a bit of sparse reporting, and given the fact that it's a DNR and based on the historical reporting patterns of DNR, this type of reporting for this type of DNR agency is typical. Let's move on to a final example. Um, we're going to look at the second to last agency highlighted in pink. It's Hinton PD. We're going to um, take a poll at this point, and we're going to let you decide whether you think um, this data, there, this agency has missing data. So we notice for this agency that the total property crimes is 60, and the number of consecutive zeros is greater than or equal to four. Um, looking at the reporting of this agency and considering the zero classification guidelines, we would like to ask you, the participants, how you would classify this agency's data as whether it's missing or not. And we'll just give a moment for that poll to appear, and you have a, about 30 seconds to um, respond. Hey, Christina, just a moment. The uh, polling switched to you. Let me switch it back. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so there's our poll. So again, we're looking at Hinton PD. Um, it was highlighted in pink. Um, it was actually identified by both the criteria for the total P being greater than 25 and the number of consecutive zeros being greater than or equal to four. We noticed that this uh, string of zeros reported is in months nine through 12. And we're asking you whether you would consider these zeros reported as missing data. And shortly, we'll see the results of that. Um, so moving on, once we go through and classify whether data is missing or true zeros, we're going to replace any data that we've classified as miss missing with a period. So our data sheet, um, and it appears that from the results of our poll, a majority of the people who responded do think that there are issues with Hinton PD's reporting in that particular example. So here we show the data set with the uh, suspect data filled in with the periods. Um, this is going to conclude step two in our imputation process, and it now prepares the data for outlier detection. 
So step three in our process is outlier detection. The West Virginia SAC has developed two outlier detection methods to assist with identifying irregular data. The outlier statistics are used with graphical analysis to help determine if data is irregular. The first statistic is named the ratio of ranges and is used to identify an agency with potential outliers. The second statistic, called the ratio to median, helps identify the month irregular data is located. Agencies and data can be identified by one or both methods. The graphical analysis is used to visually inspect data and includes three different plots. The first plot is a histogram to visualize the data distribution. The second plot is a dot plot to visualize the data spread or formation of clusters. And the third plot is a line chart to visualize the reporting pattern and any type of seasonality. Here are the formulas that we use to calculate the outlier statistics that, statistics that we've developed at the SAC. The ratio of ranges measures the magnitude of the ratio between a gap in the data and the data spread. Data that have irregular reporting tend to have ratio of range values that are large. The development of this statistic was guided by the mechanics of Dixon's Q test, which is an outlier test used on data with small sample size. The second statistic, ratio to median, is simply the ratio between the observed data for a particular month divided by the agency's median. This method measures how large or how small an agency's monthly data is compared to its median. The basis of this statistic comes from the cross-sectional outlier detection test used by the FBI on the UCR data, which compares the agency's crime rate to the medium crime rate of the strata that the agency belongs to. These statistics here that we've shown were developed because traditional outlier detection methods failed. An examination of the traditional methods and the methods developed by the West Virginia SAC are in the 2013 imputation report. So moving back to our data quality tool, we left off with replacing the missing data with periods. To conduct the outlier detection, we click on the button to the right that says, click here to generate new data for outliers. So when we click on that button, it runs the macro. Um, with this macro, four new worksheets have been created. Two of the worksheets are for calculating the outlier statistics in the violence and property data and two worksheets are for graphical analysis. Here we show the data worksheet generated for violent crime data. To run the automated outlier detection techniques, click on the button on the right that says click here to check for outliers. After activating this macro, a text box will appear with a message that says potential agencies and data that have potential irregular data are highlighted we're going to click OK to view our data. Here we show the results of running the macro on sample property data. At the top of the worksheet, we have our threshold values for the ratio of median and ratio of ranges methods. And we also notice that we have the number of agencies that have been identified using each of these methods. The default thresholds for these statistics for the ratio of median is set to four, and 0.25 and set to 2 for the ratio of ranges. These thresholds can be changed by the user as needed. Using the default thresholds, five agencies have been identified for each method. Agencies and data that are highlighted when the outlier statistics are greater than the threshold values. For the ratio to median statistic, agencies are also highlighted if the statistic is less than 0.25. This is because the reporting can be either larger than the median or, small, or smaller than the median. So the agencies that are highlighted in orange were identified by the ratio of ranges method. The agency name in all of the agency's data will be highlighted. The method indicates that there may be a potential issue somewhere in the monthly reporting but this method is not capable of identifying the specific month or months where the irregular data is located. The agency data highlighted in red are identified by the ratio of median method. 
only data that is suspected to be irregular are highlighted. Agencies and data that are identified by both methods will be highlighted in orange and the detected monthly data that has potential irregularities will be highlighted in red. The variables on this new worksheet include the variables that were in the zero classification guidelines, which were the ORI agency name and the monthly data, January through December. In addition to the new variables of crime total, median crime count, the ratio of range statistic, which looks at the data that is extremely large and data that is extremely small. On this sheet, it's called RI max and RI min. And then there are 12 additional variables that indicate the ratio of median statistics for months January through December. The number of outliers identified by both methods are also variables included in this worksheet. We want to emphasize that the methods and this tool are meant to be a way to filter data that may have potential issues with irregular reporting. The data identified will need to be manually inspected and classified as acceptable or not. When classifying the data, we want to be conservative. Irregular reporting is excessively different from the norm. Looking at the agency reporting for months not identified and graphical analysis is going to assist with classifying the identified data as whether it is acceptable or not. So let's take a few moments and look at, a, at the examples on this current page. The first agency to be high, highlighted is Hinton PD. It's identified using the ratio to median method only. We notice that the month two is highlighted in red and the ratio to median statistic for this particular month located on the right hand side of the page is 0.1. 0.1 is smaller than 0.25, hence the red highlight. We look at the rest of the reporting to determine whether this data identified is excessively different from what is reported. Based on the reporting pattern of other months, months this value does not seem extreme. The value identified would be classified as acceptable, but graphical analysis will be used to either refute or support this decision. Let's move on to the next agency. Right under Hinton is Huntington PD. Huntington was identified by both methods. As we can see, Huntington is highlighted in orange and then there are specific months that are highlighted in red. There are three months of data that were detected using the ratio to median method and they are highlighted in red. The agency name and the remainder of the data are highlighted in orange as indicated by the ratio of, meet, of ranges method. Looking at the reporting pattern for the months that are not highlighted red, the data that is reported in months two, three, and four do seem very low. It would appear that the data at this point is outli are, are, are outliers, but graphical analysis will help support this decision. On this sheet, let's skip down a couple of um, agencies to Morgantown 2 PD. This is the second to the last agency highlighted in orange. This agency is identified solely by the ratio of ranges method. Here, we will need to look at the data to determine if any of the months appear excessively different. In this case, graphical analysis will be critical in visualizing the data to help classify whether the data is acceptable or not. So at this point, manual inspection would consist of going month by month and seeing whether 101 is acceptable, 92 acceptable, 95 acceptable, 97, expe or excuse me, 79 acceptable, then we get to 24. Um, again, we'll look at graphical analysis to help make a decision on this agency or not, of whether it's acceptable or not. Finally, let's look at the last agency highlighted, Parkersburg PD. This method is, or excuse me, this uh, agency is highlighted by both methods and we're going to take a poll and let the participants decide whether they think the data or any of the data in this agency is irregular. So looking at the reporting history and considering our outlier statistics, do you think this agency has any irregular data?
Okay, our poll has ended and our results will be displayed shortly. Let's move on to graphical analysis. Uh, before we do that, if we go back to our um, automated outlier statistic worksheet, um, to generate the plots for graphical analysis, there is a button at the top of this worksheet that says click here to go to plots. When you click on that, um, that button, a macro will run and produce the following plot. So this macro produces three plots that are displayed for each agency. The first plot is a histogram, the second a dot plot, and the third is a line chart. In the tool, you can scroll down the page to compare plots. Irregular plots tend to stand out when you're scrolling through looking at multiple agencies. So let's take a look at the first plots for Huntington PD. Recall on the previous page with the automated outlier detection methods, we noticed that there may be some potential um, irregular data reporting. The histogram for this agency is skewed left as opposed, to, as opposed to being skewed right or being symmetrical, which would be characteristic of acceptable or regular reported data. The dot plot, the plot in the middle, has two distinct clusters instead of one tight cluster, which would be characteristic of, of regular reporting. And the line chart shows a sharp dip, which is an indication of irregular reporting. The graphical analysis also shows strong evidence that the data in months two, three, and four are outliers. So at this point for Huntington PD, using the automated outlier techniques and the graphical analysis, both of those techniques provide support to classify the data in months two, three, and four as um, irregular data. And in this process of, of classifying irregular data, we would change them to missing data. So let's take a look at the middle set of plots for Morgantown 2. Recall that this agency was identified by the ratio of ranges method only. So with the ratio of ranges method, it did not identify any specific months that had issues with, with irregular reporting, but it's up to the user to identify what, what we think is, um, is an outlier. So looking at these plots, our histogram again, appear skewed left, um, similar to, or almost by, by modal, um, and it's similar to the Huntington PD plot. The dot plot shows either a large spread or two clusters, depending on how you would see it. The, the points with this particular dot plot is that the data points are quite spread out on the number line. The line chart shows a sharp drop in months five and six. The line chart can also be used to uh, summarize what the reporting was. So on month five or six, it appears that about 30 crimes were reported compared to crime reports in other months, which are in the 80s or 90s. The ratio of ranges method, in addition to the graphical analysis, do support the decision that these data in months five and six would be classified as irregular. So let's take a look at the last set of plots. These last set of plots are an illustration of what acceptable reporting would look like. Notice the histogram is skewed right. This is characteristic of the Poisson distribution. Having a histogram that is symmetrical or bell-shaped, characteristic of the normal distribution, is also acceptable. But in analyzing crime data, a, a large portion of the histograms that were done with the agencies do tend to have the skewed right Poisson type distribution. Um, which is a distribution of count data. The dot plot in the middle shows a relatively tight cluster. Finally, the line chart does appear to show some seasonality, but there are no major or steep jumps in the data. So using the outlier detection methods with graphical analysis does help support decision making when determining whether data is acceptable or not. And um, going back to the results of the poll, um, a majority of the people who participated did oh, go to this slide, um, did feel that Parkersburg had issues with irregular reporting. So like we did in the zero classification guideline data, 
we're going to, once we've determined that an agency has irregular data, we're going to replace that data with a period. Replacing the data with a period sets the data up for the imputation process. This concludes step three in our data um, step in the, or in our imputation process, um, and we're one step closer to applying our imputation methods. So before we can impute data, we need to collect a few additional pieces of data. Step four is to identify non-reporting agencies. To do this, you'll need a complete list of, eight of all agencies in the state. In West Virginia, a complete agency list is obtained from the state repository, which is housed at the state police headquarters. Step five is to obtain population estimates. We need the population estimates for cities and counties that are served by municipal police departments and county sheriff departments. This data is found on the U.S. Census Bureau website and the links to, the, to state data for population estimates are provided on this slide. Step number six in our process is to obtain the MSA status for all county sheriff departments and zero population agencies. This data is found on the Census Bureau website and links the state and the links provided are for state data um, that can be used for your state. So on collecting all of that extra data, we're now ready to discuss our imputation methods. Step seven is applying our imputation methods. There are two different imputation methods that we apply to the data. These methods are dependent on the number of months of data reported or data missing. Um, for partial reporting agencies, these are agencies that are missing one to nine months of data. The data is imputed using quarterly averages. This method, method use the, uses the concept of moving averages, which is a statistical technique used to handle short-term fluctuations in data. For agencies missing 10 to 12 months of data, imputation methods use population, crime rates, and population groups to impute the annual crime total for these non-reporting agencies. The West Virginia imputation method for non-reporting agencies scales the existing FBI population groups to adjust for the population distribution of the state. The FBI population group intervals seem too broad for the West Virginia population distribution. The method for calculating partial reporting agency, agency partitions the data into quarters and uses the average of the data in each quarter to impute for missing data. Quarter one includes data from December, January, and February. Quarter two includes data from March, April, May, and so on, as listed on the slide. Now, if all the data in quarter one are missing, then we're going to use the smallest average from quarters two, three, or four. If all the data in quarter two are missing, then we use the average of quarter four and vice versa. If all the data in quarter two are missing, and all the data in quarter four are missing, then we use the average of quarters one and three. The largest average of quarters one, two, and three are used if the data from quarter four are all missing. Finally, if the data from, the, from three entire quarters are missing, then we do use the average of the remaining data. And shown here on this slide is essentially the algorithm that we use in making the decisions of what to use when, when we are missing an entire quarter of data. So let's look at an example. Here's an example of the imputation class calculations for a partial reporting agency. We show the agency's original data so we compare the results, so we can compare the results of using imputation. Notice that the data are rearranged into rearranged to group the quarters according to the imputation procedure, imputation procedure. Here the agency is missing seven months of data. We find the average for each quarter. Since all the data from quarter one are missing, we're going to use the smallest average of quarters two, three, and four, which looking at, at the averages for quarter two, three, and four, 
we note that quarter two has the smallest value, so the average 55 is going to be used for quarter one. We then use imputation, the imputation formula to calculate the crime total for this agency. After using imputation, we note that the crime total is 768. The original crime total for the agency was 834. If we do not use imputation and report the data as is, the crime total would be 347. When we use imputation, the crime total again is 768. Although the agency total using imputation is less than the original, it is still much closer to the original than reporting data as is. So the process of computing imputation for non-reporting agency requires a few data processing steps. We discussed earlier the additional data sources that we need to perform the imputation for non-reporting agencies. So cities and, and counties that are served by municipal police and county sheriff departments need population estimates. All county sheriff departments and zero population agencies need to be assigned an MSA status. All agencies will need to be assigned to one of eight population groups using the population group criteria. For each population group, we calculate a crime rate using all the agencies in that population group that reported 12 months of data. And then we use the population estimate and the group crime rate to get the total crime for the non-reporting agency. Here we show the formula used to calculate the crime total for the non-reporting agencies. The calculation is the same one used by the FBI. The difference between the FBI and the West Virginia imputation methods for non-reporting agencies is that the criteria used to determine population groups are different. Included here on the slide are the population group criteria that we use in the West Virginia imputation method for non-reporting agencies. If you note and are familiar with the FBI population groups, the one that we use in the West Virginia imputation in the West Virginia imputation method are scaled version of the ones used by the FBI. Um, we feel that these population intervals fit the population distribution here in West Virginia. So let's look at an, an example of how we calculate the crime total for a non-reporting agency. We have included the agency's original data to see the impact of imputation. This data is from a municipal police department. So to calculate the crime total, we use the agency's population and the crime rate for the population group two. Our resulting crime total using imputation is 991. This result is slightly higher than the original crime total of 893. But if we did not use imputation, the crime and reported the crime as is, the crime total would be zero. Let's look at another example for illustration. So the data from this agency is from another municipal police department in the same population group. So we're talking about another agency in population group two. Here, the original crime total is 1,204. When we apply the imputation method, the crime total is 1,034. This is an underestimate as opposed to the previous slide when we applied the imputation method was an overestimate. The imputed values do seem better than reporting the data as is, which would re again result with a crime total of zero. In summary, the imputation methods do fluctuate between overestimating and underestimating data, but these methods do seem to be better than reporting the data as is. If we are using imputed data to calculate crime trends for a state or a county, often the over and underestimates generated by the imputation methods tend to even themselves out. A discussion about bias, the tendency for a method to over or underestimate data, is included in both of the imputation reports that were produced by the West Virginia SAC. So the final step in our process, now that we've applied the imputation methods, is to go ahead and calculate statistics using the imputed data. Here we illustrate the effect of imputation on reporting crime trends 
for the state using statewide incident-based reporting data. The plot on the left shows data reported as is, and the plot on the right shows data with imputation. We can see that there is a difference in the amount of crime reported in each plot. In general, the plot with the imputed values shows a larger number of crimes. This is because they have been accounted for by the imputation. Another thing that we notice is the shape of the trend is different. For example, looking at the increase and decrease between 2009 and 2010, in the plot with the data as is shows an increase where the plots with the imputed data shows a decrease in crime. It is worth mentioning that in 2010, there were 26 more agencies reporting data than in 2009. Therefore, the crime trend in the data reported as is may be related to the number of agencies reporting data rather than trends in crime fluctuations. So at this point, we'd like to uh, ask your opinion on um, seeing the imputation methods and seeing a brief illustration of the impact of imputation on calculating statistics. Would you consider using imputation methods in the future? We'll wait a, a few moments for that poll to be launched. And as we're waiting for that, we'll, we'll move on. And um, at this point, we're we would like to discuss a few of the major findings from the research that we've conducted with our, our two um, reports on data quality and imputation. So in wrapping up, um, using state incident-based reporting data, we wanted to share a few of our results. First, the imputation can reliably and reasonably estimate for missing data that would otherwise go undetected and uncounted. It offers a way to strengthen data quality. In the research, about 20% of agencies were identified using data quality techniques. The quantity of agencies identified remained consistent across our five-year study period. Alternative imputation methods for the partial and non-reporting agencies developed by the West Virginia SAC were more accurate than the methods used by the FBI. Determining the accuracy of the methods was done using the mean absolute error and the root, root mean squared error in determining um, which methods were most accurate. Based on the accuracy statistics, the MAE and RMSE, which are the ones I just mentioned, the research suggests that reliable state crime totals can be estimated when up to 40% of the data are completely missing. So looking at the results of our poll, um, a majority of the people who uh, participated did indicate that they would use imputation methods. So in wrapping up the presentation and the webinar here today, um, we want to talk briefly about future directions for this imputation research. We hope to continue researching data quality and imputation methods using incident-based reporting data. Some future work would include testing the methods using other state or jurisdictional data. Testing the methods on different data will help determine how robust these methods are and give insight to the application on national data. Another area of research would include looking at imputation methods that do not use population data. When methods rely on population data, they cannot impute for agencies that are not associated with a population, meaning are zero population agencies. So um, going hand in hand with that, developing an imputation method for zero population non-reporting agencies could offer more precision in our imputation methods. Another project would be to refine the data quality tool um, and incorporate the imputation methods into it. Um, there are a lot of directions for continuing this research, and we do hope to explore them. 
Um, thank you so much for your time, and we'd like to move through the discussion to any questions that uh, participants may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, I think, uh, Jay, I think at this point, if you have a question, you're able to uh, type that question in and we'll receive it and uh, we'll make sure that everybody knows what the question is so that it can be responded to. Um, I want to thank you very much, Christina. As everybody can see, that uh, a great deal of work has gone into trying to identify steps and imputation methods that could be used in other uh, jurisdictions. Uh, uh, the interest, I think, of ours and uh, maybe others on the call is, is to replicate what worked in West Virginia and to use data from other states uh, or other places to see if we can uh, see if these imputation methods hold true um, with different types of data. Uh, West Virginia, you know, is a bit unique in terms of its rural nature. Uh, maybe look to get data that uh, has also some large metro areas in it and other things might be worth exploring. Um, one question, before some of the questions start to come in, Christina, uh, one of the questions that uh, has been posed is, um, and, and this goes to really the methods that you used, and I think it, it's, it's explained, but how would, the person says, how would states with less than 100% reporting implement a similar imputation method? Um, that, that's a really great question, and that's something that we considered in our first initial report on imputation methods. Um, NIBRS, you know, the UCR has a large coverage of national data. I think it's, it's around 98%, where NIBRS, on the other hand, is 28%. So we do realize that there are states that are not 100% reporting. So in our first imputation study, what we did is we looked at the impact of imputation on the scenario of agency data that is completely missing. So we looked at intervals that went in um, intervals of 10. So we looked at the imputation methods applied to data that had 10% of the data simulated to be missing, and then 20%, 30%, 40%, all the way up to 80%. And we looked at the accuracy of the imputation methods knocking out complete sections of data. Um, what we found and was discussed on a couple of slides earlier is that the imputation methods did not show any differences in or statistically significant differences in accuracy when up to 40% of the data was missing. Um, so states that do not have 100% reporting could um, reasonably use the non-reporting imputation methods to generate and um, estimate for their, their data provided that the amount of data that is not captured is no more than 40 percent. And, and again, in that situation, you would be looking at using the, um, the non-reporting imputation method. Okay, that's great. Um, one of the, another question that I think maybe you can just expand on, uh, you hit on it towards the end of the presentation, but uh, people are asking, you know, what role does imputation play in the analysis of IBRS data? And once you've imputed the data, what, what kinds of things can you do and what would you want to do with it? Um, sorry, can you, I was, I was scrolling through reading some of the other questions. Can you repeat that? I need to pay attention. Yeah, <laughs> this is the question. Yeah, this is just a question relating to um, the analysis of IBRS data. And uh, the person asked, what, what role does imputation play in the analysis of IBRS data? Um, so I think maybe expanding upon a little bit about, uh, you know, once you've imputed, um, how might you use the imputation data for analysis? Um, it's another great question, and it's it's another you know, kind of caution that the FBI uses. Um, I, I feel that imputation, imputation's role on reporting and the analysis of IBRS data is something that's done on kind of a, a larger scale, like reporting crime trends, something where you're looking at a bigger picture. And in looking at that bigger picture, you want a more accurate representation of what, what you believe 
is um, is is better. For example, we we depicted crime trends, and um, we saw an increase in the number of crimes that were depicted in the trend. But we also noticed that the fluctuations changed with imputation, which is which is interesting. Um, a lot of times, reporting the data as is. Um, can be a reflection of the crime reported, but sometimes in, in the case in West Virginia, in doing this research, we found that it also is strongly related to the number of agencies that reported data. Um, so imputation, I think, would would suit very well to doing an analysis on a on kind of large scale stuff. We don't want to get too detailed with imputation, and we sh we should caution that we don't want to be assigning you know, something so specific like, for example, this is an extreme case, murders. We don't want to say, well, you know, we don't want to start assigning jurisdiction murders. We want to keep it kind of broad enough so that we feel comfortable um, with what we're imputing, but we don't want to get specific enough to erroneously assign crime that isn't actually there. So again, the analysis would would be something that's a little bit on a on a larger scale or um, in a type of aggregate type of situation. Okay. Okay. So we're getting a, a few good questions here. We've got another question, um, and I think that's this. I mean, you went over this a little bit in the presentation, but you might want to elaborate on this. Uh, and the question is, do you have agencies? Um, with substantial seasonal variations, and uh, how and does this analysis take that into account? Um, yeah, there's kind of two examples that I would that I would go into in developing our imputation methods for the partial reporting agencies. Um, we plotted the data from the entire state to kind of look at what the reporting structure was. And in doing this, we noticed that there was kind of a parabolic shape or a, a curve shape to it that did show seasonality. Higher crime was reported in the middle months and lesser crime on the, um, you know, January, February, November, December, well, more December. Um, so this kind of is what led to us doing the quarterly averages. And doing the quarterly averages, we do take seasonality into account. Um, but that seasonality does have, is making the assumption that the crime reported in, for example, December, January, and February is the same. Um, so we do feel like our, our partial reporting imputation methods are taking seasonality into account. Um, Okay. Um, all right. So there's a, there's another question that I think I can help with a little bit, and then you can follow up on. But uh, the question is, you know, have you been able to do outreach to agencies with non uh, who are non-reporting in order to both confirm imputation results and/or follow up to improve their reporting? Well. One of the issues that we have, and this is probably true of many states who have, who have uh, gone with diverse data and, and doing diverse data, is, is that uh, while you can have, you know, 100% geographic coverage and a lot of agencies reporting, there's often times where um, there might be layoffs or transitions and so forth, and, and some crimes just simply do not get reported, and there's variations due to just some operational reasons. And also over the years, just looking at NIVRS data, because we've used NIVRS data on many reports, um, oftentimes we'll just have, you know, an agency that had typically reported pretty well drop off the map for uh, three months, four months, and, uh, and we're able to see it in the data and we know that it's happened. Um, in terms of actually going out and doing outreach and getting people to report better, um, the Statistical Analysis Center here in West Virginia is not the repository, and we are not that we do not house the data and manage the data, but we use the data for research purposes. So we communicate uh, information back to the the repository uh, staff, and we try to encourage them to set. Uh, timelines and to follow up with agencies and do that sort of thing. 
and also provide training because some of the research in the in the statistical analysis center we've done in past years have also looked at issues of statistical accuracy and whether we're classifying uh, crimes properly. And so there's been a lot of discussions about how training could be used to improve not only reporting, but also the accuracy of that reporting. So we do make attempts, but it's uh, primarily the responsibility job of the repository to, to, to make inroads there. Uh, Christina, do you have anything to add with that? Um, yeah, two things. Uh, you know, when the data that we're working with at the SAC, it, like like Stephen mentioned, is um, housed at the state repository. I guess one what and we when we get our data, we get a large data dump once a year, which means that if any data is updated, we don't get that. So one way to address that would be to say, hey, can we get the reporting back in 2007 to see if anything has changed because the data we received in 2007, we received in April of 2008. And at this point, if anything additional were added to it, we may be able to see that in a new data dump. The second thing is to determine the accuracy and what, which was done in the research that, that we did was to use simulation. Um, what we did to determine the accuracy of these imputation methods and come to the conclusion that the, these new methods are performing at least on our data and our simulation and the FBI is, is we took data that had 12 months of reporting and then we artificially knocked data out to simulate the missing data and then we estimated using our imputation methods and in doing that we did have the original data and we had the imputed data so we could find the difference. Um, so you know doing that type of simulation does give us an avenue for determining what the accuracy of the imputation methods are. Um, again, to, to keep plugging our reports, um, we did a simulation study in both of our imputation research projects, and um, the results of those are in um, each of those reports. Okay. All right, so I, we're getting some other good questions, and. Um... And I'm just making sure we have time. Forgive me if I don't get to your question, but uh, a question somebody has is, and this is something that actually uh, Christina and I talked about at the beginning of this project and really highlights what we're trying to do here. Uh, somebody asked, you know, they said, well, you know, our state office, you know, almost exclusively uses SPSS. Uh, for crime reporting and analysis and these kinds of things. Is there any way to get SPS at syntax and other things that would, um, you know, uh, would allow these, uh, you know, uh, identification techniques and, and imputation and so forth take place? Well, what I, my answer to that is, is, is one of the things that we thought about from the very beginning about what we wanted to accomplish with this project was we want to make it accessible and, and done by people who might not be crime analysts and might not be uh, necessarily researchers in and of themselves. We wanted to provide tools that uh, could be used and be readily accessible. So it was a pretty conscious choice to use SPSS or uh, Excel for this rather than SPSS, which we use SPSS daily as well. But uh, the idea was to, to, to do something that would allow um, a lot of people to have access. And, uh, and as I said before, one of our goals and one of the things we'd like to do is, is see this and see our guidelines used to, to see if, it, if those guidelines are validated with other data sets and so forth. I think that would be um, you know, sort of a valuable thing to learn. Um, I don't know, do you have anything to add to that, Christina, in terms of why we chose Excel and that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, it's it, we chose Excel because um, using the macro function in Visual Basic, we could do, I mean, what's going on in the background is there's a lot of computations, and we wanted it to be accessible. And essentially, what's required using the data quality tool is just to copy and paste the data in and press buttons. Um, as far as converting, like directly converting the, the VBA code to SPSS syntax, it's probably probably 
feasible, but in the, in the VBA code, there are things like, you know, create a button that says this and links to these macros. I know that a lot of, you know, SPSS and SAS do have the capability of recording macros, so I do think it is definitely feasible. Um, but, you know, at, I guess that would be one of the future directions that this research could take on is um, creating a macro or some type of tool that could be imported into SPSS to do this particular type of analysis. So it's, it doesn't exist now, it, can, it could be done, um, and maybe that's a direction or something that we look at for the future. Yes. Okay, and uh, back to the whole idea of validation and being able to validate whether what we're coming up with um, through these imputation methods are in fact true numbers. Um, we have a good question here about, uh, you know, is it possible to do validation studies by going to the home offices of a sample of agencies? Or would it be the case that those crimes are also missing at those, those law enforcement agencies as well? I mean, I can take a stab at this, and, um, you know, I think that that's a great idea. I mean, it is possible to probably take um, a host of agencies, see if we can validate on those crimes that were not reported, that sort of thing. I don't know whether um, those crimes are going to be in there or not uh, in those agencies, and whether the paperwork or the the, the procedures and everything will, will be in place to allow us to to do that, I think that's worth exploring. And uh, we, we as a statistical analysis center have done audits uh, where, you know, many people are probably on this call are familiar with doing audits of your criminal history record system where we go out to, to agencies and then uh, look at arrest records and see if they show up in the repository. Um, so this isn't foreign to the idea of trying to validate these imputation methods that way. Um, and that is one that is one something to consider. So, do you have anything that you'd like to say to that, Christina? Is how how we might validate these imputation methods in different ways? No, I think that how you responded is a you know is one way. Other than the simulation that we used, is to go do an audit. Yeah, I think that's that is another way to validate what we've done here. Okay. Um, right now, I don't see a whole lot of other questions coming through. I'm kind of digging through them a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do. I have one on here that was sent privately, and um, I, I think I got another message about this, but it brings up whether we used bootstrapping. Um, in in um, Developing the initial research project on what in, what alternative imputation methods we wanted to explore, bootstrapping was something that I had in the back of my head. However, we did not explore that because we were trying to make these as accessible as possible. And I, while I do think bootstrapping is a method that is worth doing some research on, for the purposes and the goals of this particular research that we were doing, um, we did not include bootstrapping in our um, research on imputation methods. But I will, um, I think the, the most sophisticated route that we went as far as our alternative imputation methods was we did look at regression. Regression looked very promising, um, but again, there's a, there were some issues with regression that we didn't, um, that we weren't able to address when we looked at our longitudinal study. Therefore, in the longitudinal study, we used the imputation methods that were presented here. Um, I think something that is very worthwhile as far as um, future research goes is to look at regression methods, maybe reconsider bootstrapping. Um, but I, I do think that continued research on the area of imputation is valuable because I think there is something out there that is more precise and still accessible to, um, to analysts and researchers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, we also have a question here that, um, and I'm trying to reword it to think about what, what maybe the big picture is here, but um, is, they're asking the question, you know, 
how do you discuss the, imputa the, the use of imputation in any, any of your reports that we're using to report trends and these things? Well, one of the things that really kind of spawned us and, and got us thinking about the need to do imputation was because uh, over the years, I myself have presented various statistics using NIVRS data in the state, and, and oftentimes I get responses from law enforcement officers themselves. Well, you know this isn't accurate, right, you know, or something to that effect. They'll, they'll question the data uh, that they, in fact, submitted. <laughs> And a lot of that is due to their, their acknowledgement that not all the crimes are reported, A, accurately, so the statistical accuracy and the, the actual crime classification has error, but also the fact that uh, maybe some agencies are not reporting and some are not reporting on a regular basis and so forth. So there's an acknowledgement out there in the law enforcement community and uh, themselves that they have concerns about the accuracy of NIBRS data. So, I felt it was necessary as just as a state planning agency and thinking about our data and, and reporting any sort of trends and using it for evaluation to say, essentially, why don't we go ahead and explore what we might be able to do to impute the data? Uh, what we'll probably when are likely to do in the coming year or so is to use these methods to report the actual as well as the imputed methods and start to educate people a little bit on why we're presenting both and um, and talking about it, um, you know, about what it is and, and so forth. I think it will also help if we can get, you know, if we can further validate uh, what we're doing. Uh, we feel like, you know, the, the study that was just published and, and uh, is available on our website at JRSA, we feel like um, it does, in fact, validate our methods, and our method, and the methods seem to be doing a better job for our state than than the techniques used by um, the FBI for the national uh, figures. So we feel like it's it, it, it. We're pretty confident that it's moving in the right direction. But uh, as usual, you know, further exploration, you know, can be warranted. Um, so. We are uh, to the point now where I don't have too many other questions, but here's, we have one uh, last polling question we'd like for everybody to participate in who is still on the call. We want to make sure that we get this answered. So Jason is going to put the last polling questions up. These are very important for assessing, you know, the, the value of the uh, webinar itself. Those are now posted. If everybody could go ahead and respond to those. Uh, those questions. Um, did the webinar provide information that was new? Um, will it be useful for your work? And is this something you'd recommend to coworkers? That would be very valuable feedback for us. We really appreciate that. With that said, I think we're coming near the end at this point. I'd like to thank uh, Christina, um, as well as everybody in the audience, uh, for joining us today. Um, we hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and we hope you will join us in the future um, for future webinars, um, and we hope it was very beneficial to you. So thank you again for joining us, and um, have a great afternoon, and please uh, take just a moment to respond to our final polling questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen and Christina. Just a housekeeping note here. I am going to try to get the um, presentation and